on February 1st, 2022, the last remains of the Archer House came down, finally demolished more than a year after a devastating fire rendered it unsalvageable. For 143 years, it stood on the east bank of the Cannon River, dominating Northfield's Division Street. Well, there wasn't anything else like it in, in town. I mean, <laughs> it's in the historic district, too. Uh, and so within a couple blocks, you go up to the Northfield Historical Society and you see where Jesse uh, James and the younger, James Younger gang robbed the bank. And, you know, so uh, you've got that history, too. It was, it was a showpiece, you know, and uh, you, you can't replace that kind of history. So I knew that the Archer House was, you know, an important asset of our downtown. I mean, a, sort of a pillar, the way it's structured on the river, our, on Division Street. But I just didn't realize the personal effect that it had on, on people. I don't know how many uh, texts and emails I got and, and uh, also looking at social media and such of people just sharing their, you know, I spent my uh, honeymoon there, you know, or anniversary or I had my groom's dinner. and. Uh, and all these different experiences and stories and memories that people had, um, it affected, I mean, it, it affected a lot of people and they really had a heart for the Archer House and uh, uh, it really hit me that, boy, this was, a, this was really an important building to a lot of people. It wasn't just a building, it was a treasure. For many, it was an icon practically synonymous with Northfield. Generations of kids leaving the library with an armful of books looked up at the big red building across the street. Countless shopping families passed under it. Visits to the Archer House by Booker T. Washington and Betty White are cemented pieces of town lore. But even then, much of its story has been forgotten. Few people know about the young couple starting anew on the East Bank. Or the hard-working women who left their legacy here or the extraordinary multi-generational story that defined the Archer House. The Archer House was a place where people learned to begin again. These are the stories of the Archer House's first century. I'm Logan Ledman. I'm Sam Temple. For this special mini-series, we're telling the story of Northfield's Archer House. We've been sharing local history for the past seven years, and we're excited to tell the incredible story of this icon, whose history begins officially in 1877, but whose story begins earlier in rural New York. There's little known about James Archer's early life. He was born in 1821 in the New York countryside. The United States was young. When James was 14, his family started farming on the prairies of northern Illinois. James was 29 when he was wed to Mary Martin. The young couple struck out north in 1855, ending up on a plot of land in southern Minnesota. It was about halfway between the growing towns of Hastings to its north and Faribault to its south. <laughs> 
This is how James Archer became a Minnesota legend. As his acquaintances remember decades later, James's old log house was the only home on the road in the area. Teamsters driving tons of wheat through the plains were ready for rest after long days of travel in a time before the railroads. And James opened his doors to any traveler. Quote, there was food for the hungry and rest for the weary, remembered the Rice County Journal. The name Archer grew well known throughout Minnesota as the reputation of this gracious man in his humble house spread. James and Mary made a successful team as they kept guests welcomed and fed. They raised horses together and James won awards at horse shows. In 1858, they celebrated the birth of their daughter, Carrie. By 1870, James and Mary moved to Minneapolis, perhaps hoping to leverage their sterling reputation into further success in the major city. But in 1871, it became clear that something was wrong. Mary's health started rapidly declining from an unknown cause. Mary died on November 17, 1872. She was only 40 years old. So after a decade of living surrounded by hundreds of friends and guests, James and Carrie suddenly lived alone in Minneapolis. Grief-stricken, James and his 14-year-old daughter moved back to southern Minnesota. They chose a small but growing town called Northfield. That is where James met Sarah. Sarah Monster had been raising her two daughters with her parents' help for a decade. She was only 35, but already a widow. Her husband died in the Civil War. So Sarah moved back in with her parents at Waterford, near Northfield. Sarah was a widow with two teenage daughters. James was a widower with one teenage daughter. Somehow, they connected, and they understood each other's grief. Their daughters were probably fast friends, and soon, Sarah and James recognized their shared experiences and compatibility, and soon, they married. While James and Sarah built their new family and their new hopes together, Northfield was struck by a sudden drama. In September of 1876, the James Younger Gang robbed Northfield's first national bank. And though Northfield foiled the robbers, the small town was nevertheless rattled by the attack and by the tragic deaths of two citizens. Northfield needed a way to be a community again to know that things would be back to normal. Only a few months later, James Archer began quietly and persistently working on a special project. For decades, Northfield hadn't had a proper hotel, a place to welcome visitors and guests into the community. And more and more visitors were pouring in to see the little town that thwarted the James Younger Gang. Shortly after the bank raid, James Archer realized he had something to contribute to this grief-stricken town. On April 3rd, 1877, James and Sarah cradled a new daughter, Sarah Eleanor. As they held their first child together and built their new family, their gift to Northfield rose on the riverside at the same time. On August 23rd, less than a year after the bank raid, the Archer Hotel opened on Division Street. As the local newspaper put it that week, Northfielders came, quote, from the bench, the workshop, the forge and anvil, the banks, the bar, the pulpit, the counter, the desk, the farms, and every branch of daily industrious life, end quote, to celebrate Archer's triumphant opening. And Northfield came together. I think I'm most impressed uh, when I think about how the people are so much like we are. The great party atmosphere that they had in 1877. St. Olaf didn't have dancing until the, the 60s, and, uh, but here were these people in the 1870s that were, <laughs> that were dancing until the early morning, and they didn't start the dance until 1130. James and Sarah put on a massive feast for the community and held a ballroom party that lasted until the sunrise. A year ago, Mayor Solomon Stewart had organized the first posse to track down the fleeing bandits of the James Younger Gang. On this night, he got to dance the cotillion and the double shuffle alongside his friends and neighbors. 
The place known as Archer's House was no longer a little building on a lonely dirt road. Now, the Archer House was a beautiful building, and from the beginning, it was beloved by the community. James and Sarah had built something wonderful together. They left behind a gift as they learned how to love after grief. And this gift mattered to Northfield. But they didn't stay to steward it. James sold the Archer Hotel a year after opening it. James and Sarah and their small family left Northfield. They took off to North Dakota to Homestead. It wasn't like James to stay in one spot, after all. He'd done his job in Northfield. With Sarah, James had another shot to build something from nothing out on the plains. In North Dakota, it would be like those early days in Minnesota territory. Just his family and the prairie. So they left, and the Archer Hotel belonged to Northfield. From then on, it would be up to the community to decide how to preserve their gift. Julian Anson Lawrence is one of Northfield's most charming characters. He was the perfect man to step up and run the Archer House in its next era. Lawrence was brought to Northfield from New Hampshire. When he was nine in 1861, he and his mother packed up their belongings and trekked to Northfield to start a farm. On April 12th, 1861, the United States was thrust into civil war. Julian's father enlisted in the Union Army. He died during a typhoid fever outbreak in camp at Beaufort, South Carolina on August 7th, 1862. Julian was 10 years old when he learned his father had died. It was up to his mother alone to raise him for the rest of his childhood. As a man, Julian Lawrence made himself a centerpiece of the community. He was a successful saloon operator downtown before he was 25. Shortly after, he joined the crew of community firefighters. In 1879, a massive fire burned down much of Carleton. As Lawrence and his fellow firefighters worked desperately, there was an accident and he fell crashing from his ladder. But he narrowly escaped serious injury and he kept fighting fires. Julian impressed people. In 1880, he was voted the most popular firefighter in the area. He became chief of the city fire department it must have surprised no one when he bought the Archer House from A.W. Dampier in 1883. Lawrence had served the community for years, and now he was ready to take on the mantle of the Archer Hotel. That same year, he married Leody Bailey. Their ceremony was on Christmas Day, and the local news called it, quote, one of the most fashionable weddings in Northfield, end quote. Lawrence became active in local politics, trading in his fireman's cap for a suit and tie to serve as a city alderman. He took on the nickname Colonel at some point in the 1880s, and he was in so many clubs, it's impossible to figure out which one started calling him that first. The Colonel was a member of a club called the Patriarchal Circle, part of the Order of Odd Fellows. He was involved in state-level Republican Party organizing. He even founded Northfield Snowshoe Club. He was, quote, one of the best known of Northfield citizens, both to the home folks and visitors, end quote. In short, Lawrence helped make sure that the Archer House practically was Northfield. But in 1889, it was time to move on. Maybe he was bored. Maybe the hotel entered a down period. Whatever the reason, Lawrence sold the Archer House. A German immigrant named Henry Kaler moved into town. In the meantime, Lawrence moved on. He was at times the state's assistant dairy commissioner, an enforcer of prohibition in the South, a traveling representative of the IRS, and a special judge for Northfield's municipal court. Northfielders recalled a particular phrase he was fond of. Friendship is remembrance, Lawrence would always say. Northfielders remembered Lawrence and the Archer House as a kind and colorful friend. 
1889, 27-year-old Elizabeth Kaler Roberts stepped into the Archer house. Her father, Henry, her husband, Homer, and her son, Arthur, walked beside her. The Archer house would be her home for the rest of her life. Elizabeth spent her early years traveling back and forth with her father, Henry, over the Canadian border. Henry was a German immigrant. He'd follow work anywhere he could get it, any place that needed a harness maker. She grew up on these cross-country trips, helping her mother Amelia as a dressmaker, and helping take care of her five younger brothers. In 1883, they all settled down in Dundas, Minnesota, where Henry had the idea to open up a hotel for travelers leaving the Northfield area. The location was smart, right by the Dundas train station. At the train station, Elizabeth met a 25-year-old depot agent. At some point between train rides, the two young adults started chatting. The man's name was Homer Roberts, and evidently they got on well with each other. They married in 1886. Elizabeth gave birth to her first son in 1887. She named the boy Arthur. Two years later, her father purchased the Archer House from Julian Lawrence. For the next decade, the Kaler family was the centerpiece of the Archer House. Henry was apparently, quote, genial, dapper, and a bit of a show-off, end quote, who understood the importance of entertainment. Elizabeth's brother John handled the bookkeeping. Her son Arthur ran errands and did small tasks. The whole family pitched in and kept the Archer House afloat through challenges, including when a fire spread to the roof in 1890 and when a devastating recession hit the country in 1893. In 1896, Henry and John moved to Rochester to try their hand at building a new hotel there. That left Elizabeth and Homer in charge of the Archer House. But there's a clue about who did most of the work. One article a few decades later specifically referred to Elizabeth as the operator of the Archer House. Elizabeth had grown up managing five younger brothers. It must have made managing a hotel easy by comparison. In the meantime, little Arthur was growing up and continued to help out where he could. He washed dishes and helped with odd jobs around the hotel. When Booker T. Washington stayed at the Archer House, it was Elizabeth and Homer in charge, and it was young Arthur who shined his shoes. The family oversaw the construction of a new wing of the Archer House, the first major addition since its original construction. The happy days were cut short. In 1900, Elizabeth contracted cerebrospinal meningitis, inflammation of the brain and spinal cord. After only a few months, she died on May 29th. Elizabeth was only 38 years old. Arthur was 12. Elizabeth was buried in the Oaklawn Cemetery on May 31st, 1900. The entire family stood together and grieved. Elizabeth was crucial to the operation of the Archer House. Her father sold the hotel soon after her death. Homer and Arthur moved to Rochester to help run the Kaler Hotel there. Almost 20 years later, in 1917, Uncle John and 30-year-old Arthur formed the Kaler Roberts Corporation in Rochester, Minnesota. It was the beginning of a massively successful hotel business that's still around today. In 1921, the Kaler Grand Hotel opened across the street from the Mayo Clinic, quickly becoming one of the most important and successful hotels in the state. But Arthur wasn't around to see the successful opening of the Grand Hotel. In 1919, Arthur had split from his uncle to open his own hotel company. On his own, Arthur started to make a plan. Martha Edson was born in 1858 in a Norwegian farming community, down on the southeastern tip of Minnesota. When she was 20, she was living in Pennsylvania, married to a farmer named Milan Steadwell, who was 10 years older than her. For a reason that's been lost, they divorced. For a decade, Martha lived on her own, evidently, 
In 1895, she reappears in the historical record, marrying a man named Cyrus Tryon. It was a very smart marriage. Tryon was a hotel magnate in southern Minnesota, operating Owatonna's Arnold House, Austin's Tryon House, and Albert Lee's Hill House. He was 64 and she was 37. When Cyrus died two years later, Dr. William Mayo personally attended to him. Upon Cyrus's death, Martha, the first-generation daughter of Norwegian immigrants, became the sole proprietor of an incredibly lucrative business. Owatonna newspapers were impressed. Mrs. Bronson has considerable executive ability, one wrote. The town learned that Martha had helped save the Arnold House from financial ruin in the last years of Cyrus's life. Now, she kept it afloat on her own. After a few years of raising her profile, Martha met Mr. Grant Bronson. Martha Tryon became Martha Bronson in 1899. The marriage did not mean Martha lost her independence. As the newspapers put it, quote, Mrs. Bronson will continue to operate the house, end quote. In 1901, the couple opened a new hotel in Laverne, the Manitou Hotel. Most newspaper coverage of the opening says Mr. Grant Bronson has opened a hotel. But Martha had experience running a hotel. Grant did not. It seems likely that Martha had a leading role, although she probably focused more on the Arnold House in Owatonna. Either way, Owatonna's Arnold House burned down, destroying Martha's greatest project. So in 1903, as the Archer House whirled between owners and managers, Martha stepped in to offer some expertise. Showing off her marketing abilities, Martha and Grant announced the hotel would be renamed Manawa. The Bronsons claimed it was a quote-unquote Indian word meaning rest. Was that true? Almost certainly not. But it made the house theirs, and more importantly, it meant they could get the town's attention with a grand reopening. The Bronsons brought in two carloads of new furniture. The 1904 launching of the Manawa Hotel was the event of the year, according to the Rice County Journal. Guests dined on chicken volovants, stuffed olives, sliced ham, and Neapolitan ice cream. Martha wrote an original poem and delivered it aloud to the assembled patrons. There were 15 speeches given by members of the community. Martha and Grant made it clear. A new era had begun. Martha and Grant Bronson operated the Manawa Hotel from 1903 to 1911. Eight years of careful attention. So far, we've talked about the owners and operators of the Archer House, and obviously they are important to the story. But the Archer House was home to more than just the owners and the patrons. It was also home to the workers who made the Archer House run. In 1910, Alma Curlin, Mary Christie, Bertha Benson, and Mary Murr did the day-to-day -day work of attending to the Archer House's guests. Let's take a moment to step back and learn about the lives of these four women. Like most working women of the early 20th century, records about them are scarce. But an intentional search can reveal some rare details, and we can appreciate the women whose work kept the Archer House alive. In 1910, Alma A. Curlin was 20 years old. The daughter of two German immigrants, she was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on October 9th, 1889. Her father, Gustav, was a farmer and would not become a U.S. citizen until he was 59. Alma had seven siblings on the farm. She began working as a domestic when she was 16. It's not clear how she ended up in Northfield. The rest of her family stayed behind in Milwaukee. At the Manawa, far from her family, she worked as a maid in the dining room. The other dining room maid was a fellow 20-year-old, Mary Christie. Mary was born in Minnesota, and she was the result of an unlikely romance. Her father, William, was a Canadian, and her mother, Josie, was a Texan. Mary and her mother were the only girls in a family with nine sons. There's a death certificate for Mary Christie in Otter Trail, Minnesota, for December 1910. This could be her, it might not be. 
There are no marriage records for a Mary Christie with a Canadian father and Texan mother. There are no more census records matching her description. The last thing we know about her is that she was a dining room maid at the Manawa Hotel in 1910. Then, like many working class women in the historical record, she disappears. Bertha Benson was a 29-year-old kitchen maid who grew up much like Martha Bronson had. Bertha was the daughter of two Norwegian immigrants, a farm family in Newry, Minnesota. Her father died in 1893, and by 1900, Bertha started working as a servant. Ten years later, while working in the Manawa, she met Fred. Frederick Heil was a German immigrant living in Northfield, working as a harness maker at a store in Faribault. Bertha married Fred on December 28, 1910. He died in 1943. She died in 1978, 98 years old. Mary Murr was the hardest to try and find in the historical record. She was 62 in 1910, a divorced German immigrant. She arrived in the United States in 1887. She was a mother of four children. She was the cook at the Manawa in 1910. What kinds of food did she like cooking most? Where were her children? Why did she move to the United States? We don't know the answer to any of these questions, but there were answers. Mary had a favorite food, a reason she made the voyage across the Atlantic, and she raised four children, each with their own lives and stories and memories. Every year, the workers at the Archer House had stories like these women. Operators, managers, and owners came and went, but no matter who was at the top, there were always women whose labor kept the Archer House alive for 143 years, performing the essential tasks of keeping a hotel running, cooking, serving, cleaning. They lived with tragedies, triumphs, loves, and drama. Without them, there would be no Archer House, but Alma Curlin, Mary Christie, Bertha Benson, and Mary Murr have never before been mentioned in histories. We should not forget that the Archer House was not just an asset of owners, but also a place where for 143 years, people worked for a living. In 1911, the Bronsons left the Manawa to build a resort on 1,100 acres of property near Brainerd, another ambitious dream. Alma Curlin also left the Manawa soon after the 1910 census. She married a man named Albert Stressing, in 1912, moving back to Wisconsin. Albert was a fellow German-American who worked a tough job as a hammer man at a drop forge. There are brief snapshots of the rest of Alma Curlin's life, if you look hard enough to find them. During the First World War, Alma's brother, Arthur Curlin, enlisted in the U.S. Army. He died in action in France in 1918. Later, we know Alma's husband took a job as an attendant at a local zoo. Alma's son, Albert Jr., enlisted in the Second World War. He served in the Army Air Corps. He survived. Alma passed away in 1950 in Wisconsin. This is what we could find on just one person whose life was and is forever intertwined with the story of the Archer House. Martha Bronson left, the Manawa entered a chaotic period. Fred Bull took over the Manawa after the Bronsons. He named it Bull's Hotel and sold it a year later to George Stewart, who named it the Hotel Stewart. In 
Hotel Stewart had a ring to it that Bowles Hotel did not, and so it stayed under that name even when it was sold to John Rule in 1912. Then, George Stewart took it back. In quick succession over the next 15 years, the hotel oscillated between the ownership of J. Gordon, J. Mall, H. C. Miller, F. O. Morrison, John Frame, and L. B. Mulligan, among others. Looking through the newspaper for this time period, a distinct pattern emerges. In 1912, George Stewart announced he would offer a, quote, first-class, up-to-date service, end quote, in his ownership of the hotel. Seven years later, H.C. Miller planned to, quote, remodel and rebuild the hotel completely, end quote. In 1920, a Northfield News report on the Stewart said, quote, Northfield will soon have a first-class modern hotel, end quote. In 1921, new owner F. O. Morrison let the news know he had a, quote, view of furnishing Northfield with a first-class hotel, end quote. Seven years later, John Frame stepped in and the news reported that Frame, quote, expects to begin work at once to convert Stewart Hotel into a modern unit, end quote. You get the idea. A parade of men came through claiming they would turn the hotel into a modern first-class hotel. None of them did, evidently, since it never was referred to as actually having become a first-class modern hotel. The hotel stagnated. No one was willing to sink their teeth into the project. This era lasted decades, stretching through the Great Depression. In 1935, a man named J.C. Kretschmar took ownership of the Hotel Stewart. But he wasn't acting on his own. Kretschmar was employed by the Arthur L. Roberts Hotel Corporation. Kretschmar sold the hotel again soon after, but Arthur had made his point to the community. He was planning on coming home. In 1947, Arthur Roberts was 60 years old. In the decades after his mother's death, he had built a hotel empire rivaling even his relatives in the Kaler Hotel Corporation. The Arthur Roberts Hotel Corporation owned and operated at least 34 hotels across the country. Arthur's life had been a mixture of triumph and tragedy. He was celebrating 40 years of marriage to his wife, Lucy Murray, Together, the couple had one son, Thomas. Though Thomas was poised to continue his father's legacy, his life was tragically cut short in a 1934 accident. Arthur continued running his company as he grew old. And so, in 1947, Arthur announced a stunning plan to Northfield, almost 50 years after he had left it behind. He was going to buy the Hotel Stewart and demolish it. In its place, he envisioned a monument like nothing in the area, a massive 60-room building, a crown jewel in the empire he had built, in the town where it all began. He would name it in honor of his mother. The planning began as soon as the deal finished. There was plenty of red tape to cut and hoops to jump through, so he had to manage the hotel successfully in the meantime. If anyone had the right to do this project, it was him. In a way, he'd been preparing for this project since he was 12 years old. Arthur returned to the room his mother died in all those years ago, now an old man. The Archer House was not just a building. For Arthur, it was where the person he loved most had died far too young. He'd come back to make it new. Then, in 1949, Arthur's wife, Lucy, died. The plan faltered in the next few years as Arthur tried to continue on by himself. He continued to make improvements to the hotel here and there, but the plan never came together. Arthur Roberts died in 1952, three years after his wife. After a few years of wrangling with the estate, the hotel passed to the Paschall family, who passed it to the Lethbridge family in 1963, who passed it to colonial properties of the Twin Cities in 1977. The uh, 
Jefferson bus line used to stop there. And there were some colorful characters that would get off the bus and on the bus there. <laughs> 100 years after it had been built by James Archer's perseverance through grief, the hotel sank into disrepute. No one seemed able to bring the building to its former glory. It threatened to become a blight on the community. Finally, the building was condemned. To many in the community, it seemed the hotel's era as part of Northfield was coming to an end. But yeah, it, it needed somebody to come along and save it or it was gonna just be abandoned, I'm sure. It didn't have much life left in it.